Parkinson's disease has changed PJ Delaney's life since he was diagnosed in 2003. But now doctors at Shands Hospital will drill a hole in his skull that will lead to a whole new world. SNN was granted exclusive access to his entire process. How he got to this point, the surgeries, the doctor's appointments, we have it all. And we're taking you along for the ride and into the operating room in an honest, emotional, and exciting journey. Everyone loves PJ Delaney. <laughs> it's his personality. He's outgoing. His name is synonymous with fun. Diane Green describes the man she fell for more than two decades ago, a sales exec with a passion for sports. The basketball I played, yeah. Played a lot of golf over the course of the years as well. And made time for a walk with Diane every morning. It was on one of those walks she noticed something wasn't right. All of a sudden he started limping with his left leg. PJ thought it was just a basketball injury. We sort of ignored it and played with it for a while and iced it, etc. And then I started noticing his left hand started to curl. My left arm was, was just bothering me from day to day and I knew something was wrong so that's when we had to go get it checked out. They saw a neurologist who thought it was a neck injury, recommending surgery. We immediately went to a second opinion, which was Mayo Clinic, and that's what led us on our journey to discover that he had Parkinsonism. I thought I was the epitome of something that can't break, and it just, it just broke me in half. PJ was depressed over the news and says it took months for both him and Diane to accept the diagnosis. And I thought, well, I'm not going to beat it, so I'm going to fight it. And luckily, they led us on a path to the Movement and Disorders Clinic at University of South Florida in Tampa. Where PJ participated in several studies and started learning more about Parkinson's and how it would eventually take over his body. And there were days we took turns at wanting to quit. You go through periods of hallucinations and delusions and things that alter your life that you really don't understand are a result or symptom of Parkinson's. PJ's in his early 60s and his symptoms include stiffness, muffled speech, pain, and severe dyskinesia in his left leg. And I'd say they've really taken a turn in the last few years with age. Affecting him not just physically, but socially. He's not the gregarious, talkative person he once was. He takes 18 to 20 pills a day and is no longer driving or golfing. The things I loved to do when I was doing them before, I can't do them now. But their time spent in the Movement Disorders Clinic offered them a glimmer of hope. It eventually took us on a course together to seek out what else is available. And that's led us to DBS or deep brain stimulation surgery. Which has been known to help thousands with severe Parkinson's. I'm hoping that this DBS operation really gives me an, another breath of life. Now PJ tries to swim and take a walk every day to stay mobile, which he says helps his symptoms, but he hopes the operation will eventually let him play t-ball with his grandkids. Put him back on the golf course, put us back on the tennis courts together. It's going to put us back on planes across the ocean to travel again together. Two days ahead of the surgery, Diane is feeling anxious, excited, but above all, proud. He's my hero. I don't know that I could get up every day and endure what he does. PJ has Diane to lean on every day, but there are three more people in the equation who played an important role in the decision to move forward with the surgery, his kids. You know, my dad was a different guy before he was diagnosed. And I think when Katie, Brendan, and Aaron describe their dad, they can't help but smile. So many people have said that I am my father's daughter. Super funny. He has a great sense of humor. He was very much the center of attention, the life of the party. But over the past 16 years, they say that sparkle has faded away. I think over time, you know, it was less of him being active with us, like shooting hoops in the driveway or you know, throwing a football in our yard or playing baseball. It's, you know, he's, he's just quiet. He's to himself. Um, you know, he's around, but he's not around. You see this person that used to exude this, like, confidence and be so outgoing. And now sometimes when he's just 
sitting in the corner, not really talking to people. You're like, come on, like you used to be so engaging. Katie and her siblings live up north, so she says the few times a year they do see their dad, it gets harder and harder to watch him get worse. You do kind of have the out of sight, out of mind mentality sometimes. You don't realize how much it progresses when you're not around it every single day. Diane first told the kids about the idea of deep brain stimulation surgery early in 2018, but Aaron was getting married that fall. You know, one of the first things that came to my mind was, you know, you just want your dad to walk you down the aisle and do the... <sighs> PJ did walk her down the aisle, but Aaron hated seeing him struggle. We just wanted him to ultimately have a better quality of life. When Diane started educating us about what the surgery could do and showing us all of the videos of the people who had great success, you know, it's... That's all we want. They told PJ with how much worse he'd gotten, he had nothing to lose and everything to gain. This disease was taking, you know, taking my father from me, so to speak, so. We were nervous, but immediately like on board to say it's something that we need to do. The three have different goals for what their dad gets out of the multi-part surgery. And though it has a high success rate, they know DBS comes with no guarantees. I know personally I want to be able to shoot some hoops with my dad and throw some pigskin and just, you know, go back to how things were maybe five, ten years ago. Playing golf. I mean, we did the father-son tournament every year till I think I was out of college maybe. Even if this procedure improves his quality of life by 15 or 20 percent, like that to us is worth it. And they're ready to stand by their father's side as he gets ready to go into the operating room. Leading up to it and going through the education phase, I think was the scariest part. Um, but now that we're here, I'm just, I'm really excited. It's a lot, but you just kind of, life happens. You have to take it in strides, you know, so. PJ says he's more ready than ever to give DBS a shot. But what exactly does deep brain stimulation entail? How does the surgery work? That's up next. That's pretty good. It's an early morning in Gainesville for PJ Delaney and his family. The only painful part of the operation, which is the numbing medicine that I have to inject in those four spots. To best explain DBS, PJ's neurosurgeon, Dr. Kelly Foote. Not much of a complainer, are you? says the brain is a supercomputer. Different wires and circuits in the brain are responsible for things like vision and hearing. And movement. That's why PJ's here. Parkinson's disease is a disease that makes it so you can't move the way you want to move. PJ's movement circuit isn't functioning properly. That's why we're here. We get the DBS lead in just the right spot where the bad signal is coming from. We deliver rapid pulses of electricity that sort of act like white noise and, and cover up that bad signal that allows the rest of the motor network and that circuitry to function better. The lead goes in the right side of PJ's brain, which controls movements on the left side of his body, where he's had the most trouble. Wild dyskinetic movements or extra involuntary movements, stimulation really suppresses those nicely, and I think that's one of the things that PJ is looking forward to. In this operation, Dr. Foote is putting the wire in the faulty part of PJ's brain, but it's not plugged in yet. We'll attach it to the skull, and it will be coiled up under his scalp. Until his next surgery, where Dr. Foote will connect the wire to a generator that, when activated, delivers signals to relax PJ's dyskinesia. You just turn it up, you turn it down, you adjust it. Ultimately, you'll find whatever is the best settings, and then you just leave it there. Swelling caused by the surgery helps. That swollen part of the brain that stops functioning for a while, it's stunned. Since that's the part of the brain that's sending out the bad signal, it's actually therapeutic. But first, he has to get through the surgery awake. Intuitively, that sounds really scary and really painful. I promise it won't hurt, it's just loud. Until they get in there and realize, oh my gosh, this really doesn't hurt. It's just so counterintuitive to think that you could have a hole drilled in your head. All right, here we go. And something passed through your brain. Get the covering of the brain out of the way so we can see. And have it not hurt. Put yourself in PJ's place. Not fun. The whole environment is carefully manipulated to manage anxiety. He played relaxing music. Just type in classical ghost pop. 
and talk to PJ the whole time. You having fun yet, PJ? Mm -hmm. And there it is, PJ's brain. Isn't that cool? So now you're gonna win at every barbecue and cocktail party for the rest of your life, because no one's gonna be able to top, I once saw my own brain. The lead is in, and here's why PJ's awake. If you're awake, you know, you can participate, and, and I think we can maybe get a little bit better outcome. So they turned on the system. Dr. Leo Almeida takes it from here. Count to five again. One, two, three, four, five. How about your left leg? It stops all of a sudden. Do a little bit of a fine tuning before deciding where to implant the electrode, you know, in the final position. Telling them where the lead should be. One millimeter in the brain is the difference between Florida and California. PJ is tired. You okay? I'd like to end it if you could. And just like that. Congratulations, my friend. All the things we use to tell if we're in a good place are looking good. <laughs> The team at UF Health has implanted more than 1,800 DBS leads. Get you out of here, how about that? And Dr. Foote says it never gets old. There are only a couple of places in the hospital where people are happy, where they're delivering babies, and in Myola. <laughs> Everybody else is sick, but those people are coming out of this with a substantial improvement. Um, and that's, that's really fun. So step one is successful. Now we fast forward exactly one month to surgery two, where the puzzle really starts to come together. The unplugged wire coiled up under PJ's scalp was a bookmark in his story. Until today. I'll be adjusting to the juice here shortly. When the next chapter begins. Mm -hmm. Have a nice nap. Where we put him to sleep, we're going to push the hair out of our incisions, implant a pulse generator here. In his case, you know, it's about a five centimeter incision. With a cable that will run up the side of his neck and connect to the DBS lead he got in the first surgery. So we decided that incision when we were shaving. Before Dr. Foote begins, he'll put on some music. You want to do Simon and Garfunkel? Ironically, a pretty relevant song. He'll cover PJ and draping. Another opportunity for a Martha Stewart crease, like that. And we're off. This is Patrick Delaney. We're doing a right-sided dual channel pulse generator implantation. Antibiotics in? Yes. Everything else okay? Yep. All right, game on. For the next couple of hours, Dr. Foote and his team essentially carve out the perfect tunnel down PJ's right side. Screwdriver. To connect it all. And I took the dummy connector off so that it's just a bare wire. Mm. And now that loop, I'm pulling that loop out and it's just backing out. And he slides the generator in. And if we've done it right, it just sits pretty and I'm not having to push on it and it's not coming out. So that's about right. We will activate it and turn it on. And stitch him up. Oh, that looks beautiful, man. And clean him up. But the programming they do now, Dr. Foote calls quick and dirty. And the reason for that is programming a DBS device is a two-way thing, right? It's a collaborative process. And I don't know if you've ever tried to collaborate with a drunk person but when you're coming out of general anesthesia, you're not a very good collaborator. Dr. Foote says PJ should get some benefits just from having the system activated, but they will only get better. So we sort of guess based on what we saw during the operation, what is probably gonna be a reasonably good programming setting and set it really low and turn it on because most people are so excited to get it activated. And it's all an outpatient procedure. No one will know he had surgery today. So after a little time to wake up, PJ is what Simon and Garfunkel and Dr. Foote would call home I have a super fun job. You're probably thinking, wow, PJ's a trooper, and it's not even over. Here's where things really get exciting for PJ, though, because when we come back, we'll take you to one week after this surgery, when doctors calibrate the system to its most effective level. It's been a week since PJ's second surgery. He's never taken one pain pill or one aspirin, not one. You can see the excitement as they get ready to have everything fine-tuned. 
But finding the so-called sweet spot for his DBS system won't be quick and easy. Dr. Joseph Legacy explains the lead inserted in PJ's brain has four electrical contact points on it. And what we do is we, we test out a threshold. We, so that means we're going to keep gradually increasing the stimulation one by one to each of those electrodes. Until they find what they call a therapeutic window, where he gets maximum benefits without side effects. Kind of like muscle pulling or numbness tingling, some of the stuff you might have experienced in an operating room when they were testing out the contacts, kind of like we're going to do today. But this time, it'll be much more in depth. So we'll start the lowest one, we'll gradually go up, and you let me know we're just going to focus on the left side of your body. This is what the next three hours looked like. Doing okay? So far, so good. Okay, good. With different levels of simulation at different contact points, sometimes PJ felt discomfort. The tingle. Others, he felt nothing. Just numbness. He had PJ do physical tests. All the way open and close as fast as you can go. So let me move it. You're just relaxing. And verbal tests. You count to 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And he had to do them all over again with each new level of stimulation. What do you feel? Tingling again. His Parkinson's meds he took this morning are starting to wear off. Sometimes your face might feel like if the muscles contracting. Yeah, there's no feeling over here. It's all over here. After a few hours of this, you could probably imagine how exhausted he was, and it was hard for Diane to see him so uncomfortable. How about your face? My face, yeah, my mouth, I can't, I can't talk. Try going to the 10 for me. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay. But eventually, they find the optimal setting. Open and close. That looks easier. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Remember Dr. Almeida? He was in the first operating room helping PJ through similar tests. Each group of settings will have a specific letter, so A, B, C, and D. B is dancing, C is golf, <laughs> D is baseball. <laughs> Diane now learns how to work the system. Oh, that's on, okay. And then we go to C and we're gonna go back to B, right? She's a pretty quick learner. You'll hear a beep there. <laughs> Look at you. Right back on B. On, okay, B. Oh, we got it, we got it. Of course, they couldn't leave without PJ asking the important questions about things he can and can't do with the system. I love drinking a beer. <laughs> as, as long as it's in moderation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. A beer, he didn't say a bourbon, okay? <laughs> On the rocks. That was my next question. <laughs> yeah, take that one off your list. <laughs> you can tell now there's a weight lifted off both of them. That just changes the channel. Changes the channel. That's easy. You're my new flat screen. <laughs> but you can't change the channel at home just yet because PJ's story is just getting started. PJ's DBS system has been fully activated for a little over a week. So has it lived up to his and Diane's expectations? What have they learned in this process? And why did they decide to let us in? I pretty much knew what I was getting myself into. I just had to get the guts to do it. It's a journey. It's a process. Their journey still takes them back to Gainesville every 30 days so doctors can recalibrate PJ settings. And then again every seven to ten days I'll be adjusting that to the new voltage levels because it's a very tedious process to dial them up properly. But Diane says so far it's paying off. We're pretty excited. We've already noticed some very simple changes. PJ says his pain and dyskinesia are both at least 50% better. You're out and about and, and your leg is just going like 90 miles an hour and you're doing everything you can to try to stop it. So just being, being able to put my leg down and not feel a, a bit of dyskinesia is, is awesome. And his improvements reach far below the surface. I'm not more outgoing and a lot more personable than I was. His voice has come back a lot stronger. Uh, not as strong as it once was, but it's definitely improved. DBS has given him his smile. Nobody has a smile like PJ Delaney. <laughs> and some of his life back. A good feeling to be able to, to walk again. And he's getting stronger with every stride. Riding my bike in the pool and getting a lot of exercise there. He's even back on the golf course. We're hopeful. We're very, very hopeful as to where we are today, as to what's coming. It's all good.
But that doesn't mean any of it has been easy. I think I expected more when we first went in for the first settings to be put on the battery, but I've learned it's a process. One that's not ending here. Because he has another procedure a few months later scheduled to implant the other side of the brain. Dr. Foote and his team decided doing PJ's right side would make the biggest difference first. But in December, he'll put a DBS lead in the left side. Give one side of the brain plenty of time to recover from the invasion before we do the other side. So it will still